All right, folks. Good morning. Um, my name is uh, Daniel Arundares, and um, I'll be presenting. Um, at the outset, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know that I am not a lawyer. Uh, I am the housing support coordinator for ECHO. And I work within the community housing department. So uh, a quick bit about me. So I've been with ECHO since February of 2020. And prior to this, I was a housing advocate with the Austin Tenants Council for about seven and a half years. And I focused on tenant rights as they're enshrined in the Texas Property Code. My, my expertise uh, is not in federal fair housing law. My expertise, if I have any, is in uh, tenant rights, specifically as they are described in uh, the property code. ATC, uh, Austin Tenants Council, has a separate department for fair housing issues, and, and they do a great job. Um, I'm only able to present, I just want to acknowledge this, I'm only able to present this sort of information with any sort of confidence because of my time at ATC, which, uh, for which I'm grateful. Um, one last caveat uh, specific to the content of this presentation. If anyone hears me say anything that significantly conflicts with their understanding of the law or the application of the law as it applies to tenant rights, please do speak up in real time. In other words, interrupt me uh, so that we can clarify the point with each other because I don't want uh, to say something uh, which leaves anyone with a misleading impression. Um, and so again, I'll say I'm not a lawyer. There are other sources that one uh, may reference to gain a more thorough understanding of the law and its application. In other words, case law, past and present, legal opinions, et cetera, none of which inform the content that I'm about to deliver. Um, all of this is, is based solely on the Texas Property Code and in, in, in some instances on uh, uh, City of Austin Municipal Code. <clears throat> and so the primary content of the presentation is organized in five main segments. And during my delivery, uh, please feel free to enter any questions in the chat. Uh, my colleague, Paul, is, is attending. He's here and he's helping uh, with this portion of the presentation. So after each segment, we will take a couple of your questions and answer them. If I don't get to everyone's question, and if you feel comfortable to add your email to your question in the chat, I'll do my best to reply to everyone's question in writing after the presentation. Otherwise, uh, you can email me and my, my email uh, is, at, is on the last slide. All right, so let's begin. Um, very quickly, I just want to ask uh, every. I'm going to try something out. I just want to ask everybody if they can close their eyes uh, and imagine um, perhaps you are, are, in fact, a tenant. Imagine that you're a tenant um, in Texas and you're sitting in your apartment. You hear some rustling at the door. You go, you open the door. And on, on the outside of the door is a notice. The notice says um, you have 24, 24 hours to vacate the property, 24 hours. The notice does not give you a reason why it's telling you to vacate in 24 hours. And by you, I mean you and anyone else that lives with you maybe you have a family of four. So the notice is saying that everybody has to vacate within 24 hours and it doesn't give you any reason. This is a common occurrence uh, in Texas. Um, and it's, you know, it's a reality for a lot of people, especially um, during this uh, pandemic. That notice, other than the delivery of it, and I'll get into that a little later, is lawful. It is lawful in Texas to give a notice 
to ask somebody to leave their dwelling within 24 hours and not tell them why. And so the presentation that I'm about to deliver is called the basics, um, tenant rights and useful lease tips. This is just a caveat, which I've pretty much covered. It's not legal advice. Um, and uh, it only applies to ordinary residential tenants in private market dwellings. Uh, tenants residing in federally subsidized housing do have other additional and complex rights that are not addressed here. Um, at the end of the presentation, there'll be uh, additional legal and educational resources cited um, that you can refer to. And so um, I just begin with the basics. Um, a tenant has rights, you should know them and you should use them. I tried to set up this, the, the layout of these rights sort of in the order, the natural order of, uh, of which they would apply to somebody coming off the street who was applying for uh, a dwelling, a residential dwelling in Texas. And so the first right, is, is a tenant's right to receive the selection criteria when applying for housing. And um, I do provide uh, statutory um, citations here, which are linked. And so the selection criteria, um, basically a landlord has to provide the tenant when applying with the selection criteria. And significantly, the selection criteria has to include this particular statement that you see here, verbatim. If it does not include this statement, the selection criteria, and if the tenant is rejected, the tenant has a right to the refund of both the application fee and the application deposit. And that's the second bullet. So, in other words, if a tenant goes to apply for a unit, they're presented in writing the selection criteria, and that criteria does not include this statement verbatim, and then they're rejected later, the tenant has a right to go back and ask for both the application fee and the application deposit to be refunded to them. And they have certain rights with respect to how that uh, refund should be delivered, et cetera, that, that are described in, in, in the statute. The third right is the right to the refund of an application deposit. And this, um, this application deposit is, is only refundable typically if the applicant is rejected. Now rejected, I have uh, hyperlinked here because that term takes on a specific meaning in the statute. Basically, uh, a tenant is rejected if, after seven, if seven days have passed after they have applied and the landlord has failed either failed to tell them that they're rejected. In other words, the landlord does not respond to them in any way, verbally or written, after seven days, or if a, a landlord does verbally uh, or in writing reject the tenant, then they have a right to the refund of the application deposit. Um, the fourth right is a right to a copy of the lease. And by a copy of the lease, I mean a full and complete copy. Any documentation which is cited in the lease, referenced in the lease, um, but, a not, but not physically attached to the lease is not a complete and full copy of the lease. So all amendments, community rules and policies, anything incorporated, additional documents that are incorporated into the main body of the lease must be included in the copy of the lease. And, um, you know, this is important because uh, in, in all my time at Austin Tennis Council, I, I rarely encountered tenants who said that they got a complete copy of the lease. They might have gotten the first eight pages of their Texas Apartment Association lease and the addendums, but very rarely does a landlord voluntarily give the tenant a copy of the community rules and policies. But that is, um, it is part of the lease. And, uh, and the tenants uh, obligated to, to abide by them. So they have a right to it. 
Um, and, the, and the copy of the lease has to come uh, not later than the third business day after the date the lease is signed by each party. Um, the fifth right is the right to know who the owner is uh, and or the management. Um, and if a management company is located off site, um, they have a right to their name and their suit address. So this is, is it's a little nuanced in terms of uh, this particular right, but the statute describes it. But in effect, um, a tenant always has a right to know who the landlord is and where, where they should pay rent. And if, if uh, management changes, management has a legal obligation to provide uh, their contact information to the tenant. And then the final one is, is really a significant uh, right um, for tenants in Texas because they deal with it so frequently throughout their tenancy, and that's the right to repairs. Specifically, repairs that materially affect the health and safety of a tenant. And we'll get into what materially affects the health and safety of a tenant a little later. Um, moving on, a tenant has a right to certain security devices. And this is important because there's certain security devices that a tenant has a right to without necessitating notice to the landlord. In other words, they, don't, they do not have to tell the landlord, affirmatively tell the landlord, hey, give me a keyless deadbolt. It should already be installed when they sign the lease. Um, window locks are another example, a latch or handle lock on a sliding door, and there's others. Um, a tenant has a right to the return of the security deposit or the balance after lawful deductions and a written itemized description explaining the deducted amount. Now this has to come to the tenant in writing on or before the 30th day after the date the tenant surrenders the premises. Now, the caveat here, and this is important to note, especially if there's case managers on, on, this, uh, on this call, the caveat here is that a tenant has an obligation, a tenant has an obligation to provide the landlord written notice of their forwarding address. They don't waive their right to, a to the return of their security deposit if they don't provide that. But the law does require the tenant to provide that written notice of a forwarding address in order to initiate the landlord's obligation uh, to either return the security deposit or explain in writing why they're not. Um, a tenant has a right to re enter uh, if they're locked out lawfully or unlawfully um, due to non-payment of rent. And I provide the uh, statutory sections here. There's legal remedies for a tenant who's uh, locked out unlawfully. This is a, um, a specific right that I will say in, in, in my time at, at Austin Tennis Council in seven and a half years, I never encountered a uh, landlord who performed this um, performed a lockout uh, lawfully. It's, it's complicated. There's, it, there's notice requirements on the landlord's part, ad, advanced notice, and uh, I just never encountered it. So it, it's not uncommon for a tenant to be locked out. It is uncommon for a, for a landlord, in my experience, to do it properly. Um, the next right is a right to a smoke detector. Now, this is a complicated right. The statute's pretty nuanced. But in essence, um, every residential dwelling must have a smoke detector. And depending on the configuration of the dwelling, you may have more than one. Um, additionally, the city of Austin in the past probably five or seven years uh, passed an ordinance requiring that all residential dwellings uh, for, um, for renting purposes have a carbon monoxide detector. And I hyperlinked the city brochure there for you. Um, the next right is the right to a smoke alarm for a tenant with a hearing impairment disability. Now, this is a, a right that is triggered if a tenant provides a reasonable accommodation request relating to um, their hearing uh, uh, impairment. Now, this gets into fair housing. I won't say more than that, um, but it is enshrined in uh, Texas statute. And finally, um, 
believe it or not, a, a tenant has a right to refuse entry to a landlord. Now, I, I want to be very careful about what I'm about to say. And I, if case managers are listening, I, I, you know, I want, I want everybody to use their common sense. Um, but it is true that a tenant has a superior right to their dwelling unless the lease states otherwise. Now, most leases do. Most leases enshrine in the lease a landlord's right very specifically to enter the dwelling for, for legitimate business purposes. But it is a fact that the Texas statute is silent on the issue of a landlord's right to enter the property. That is why that specific issue must be addressed in the lease. If it is not addressed in the lease, then a tenant actually has a superior right to their dwelling. Now, there may be, um, there may be examples like emergencies, uh, fire, criminal activity, that sort of thing, um, which uh, are subservient to a tenant's uh, right to their, to their dwelling or to keep somebody out. But, but in general, they do have a superior right to their dwelling. Um, and, and, and a tenant should just, you know, if, if, if the landlord, if they're under a lease, that does give the landlord a right to enter uh, legitimately for business purposes. And uh, the tenant is unable to let them in on a particular occasion, the tenant should just uh, respectfully request that they come back another day, but they should be very careful about um, how often they do that. Um, and so um, the next right is, is right to utilities. Now this is pretty complex, but I'll just say at the outset that a landlord has, may never turn off the utilities. By utilities, we mean electric, wastewater, gas, um, water, may never turn off the utilities merely because the tenant is delinquent on rent or a utility payment, all right? And any lease provision providing the landlord uh, has the authority to do this is, is invalid and unenforceable. Now, there is a caveat here. If a landlord has agreed in the lease, either expressly or imp impliedly, to furnish and pay for utilities and the landlord fails to make the payment to the utility company because the account is in their name, then the landlord has liability to the tenant. And that liability is described in, in the property code and, um, and the tenant's remedies uh, for in, um, enforcement of that right. Now, in, in, in Austin, in Texas, really, um, there's two types of configurations for utilities at properties. Your utilities are either submetered or master metered. A lease will refer to it as allocated typically. Master metered is, is allocated. Um, the, I've hyperlinked some brochures here. Now that information is, is directed at property owners. It's written for property owners, but it's, it's informative uh, for tenants and for case managers who are, who are guiding tenants in this respect. And finally, I'll just say <laughs> that um, Master metered or allocated utilities, they are extremely complicated. And so all I've done here, I won't attempt to, uh, to explain uh, the nuances, but uh, I've detailed, uh, I provided links here for a detailed explanation of the topic and how a tenant's bill is calculated and how a tenant's legal, um, and what the tenant's legal remedies are. Uh, and th so that's a link to um, the Austin Tenants Council website, fact sheet for utilities. And I also linked a, um, a brochure by the Public Utility Commission. And so before we move on to the next section, I just wanted to ask if, uh, if there may be any uh, questions in the chat and maybe Paul can, can look at that. And um, we, 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 he's gonna pick a couple if there are any and, uh, and I'll attempt to answer them here, but we can take a, a short breather. Don't have any questions in the chat so far, so maybe just take a, a few minutes okay. if anybody has anything, and then I think we can move on. Okay, very good. And so if anybody has any questions, they can just um, blurt them out, or I can move on to the next section, which is uh, the lease. So moving on, um, basically, I, I wanted to shock you a little bit. You have no rights if you don't pay the rent. Um, now, I am saying that's hyperbole. Uh, 
but really it's not by much. And I've sat through um, eviction hearings in Travis County and time after time after time, whether it's uh, JP one, two, three, doesn't matter. The first question out of the judge's uh, mouth to the tenant is, have you paid rent? And there's a reason for that. Rent really is um, sort of sacrosanct in Texas. If you don't pay it, you're placing yourself as a tenant in an extremely vulnerable position if you're trying to enforce any of the rights that we just discussed. So you always wanna pay rent. Um, it's important to note that unless otherwise agreed to in a lease, the landlord has no legal obligation to accept late or incomplete rent, okay, none. Now, incomplete rent is just that. Any, a penny short of the contractual amount of the lease is incomplete rent. Now, what I do here is I cover basically the, the Texas Apartment Association lease and the Texas Association of Realtors lease. And I kind of went through and, and grabbed the main areas where I have seen tenants really um, should focus on in terms of um, their, their obligations uh, in the lease. And so the first is, um, is rent. Uh, and on the Texas Apartment Association lease is defined on page one, Paragraph six, and basically it stipulates um, that rent is due on or before the first of the month and that there is no grace period for paying the rent. You agree not to pay, you agree that not paying rent on or before the first of the month is a material breach of the lease. And I'll talk to you about what that phrase means a little later, material breach of the lease. Cash is also not acceptable without prior written permission. Now. I want, I want everybody to be clear, and we're gonna cover late fees a little later, but rent is due on the first. Rent, the landlord does not have an obligation to accept it on the second, even if the lease says that the tenant will be charged late fees later on, on the third or the fourth. The, the, the landlord does not have an obligation to, to enforce the late pre fee provision. They can simply say, you're late on rent, and now you have to leave and give them a notice to vacate. Um, and so the TA lease paragraph 34 stipulates in part that a landlord may apply rent, a rent payment, and this is the kicker, without notice, first to any unpaid obligations, then to owed rent. A landlord may apply a rent payment to unpaid obligations regardless of notations on checks, money orders, et cetera and regardless of when those obligations arose. And finally, all sums other than rent and late fees are due upon the landlord's demand. After the due date, the landlord does not have to accept any payments and the landlord has no obligation to accept later and complete rent. Now, this is, I wanna, I wanna pause here. I saw this time and time again, and it's, it's, I think it's a loophole that should be addressed in statute, um, but it hasn't. So basically the scenario that occurs, the common scenario for tenants that occurs is, let's say a tenant breaks their window on accident. That makes the tenant liable for the payment of the repair for the window. Now, the landlord has an obligation to tell them what it's gonna cost. But if the tenant pays rent the following month that they broke that window, the landlord doesn't have an obligation to tell, to verbally tell or written writing, tell the, the tenant that what they've done after they've received the rent is they've deducted the cost of the repair from the window, okay? So what happens is a tenant walks into the front office, pays the rent and walks out. And he's just thinking, well, the landlord needs to fix this window. And he goes back to, uh, he or she goes back to their unit and thinks that they've paid full rent. They haven't paid full rent. The landlord has deducted the cost of the repair of the window. And therefore they're actually uh, delinquent on rent. So, but they're not aware of that um, because the landlord did not tell them that they were going to deduct the cost of the broken window. And why didn't the landlord do that? Because the landlord gave him or herself 
the right not to give them notice of that deduction in the lease. This is a very common scenario, and this is um, why a lot of tenants uh, do um, sort of run afoul of the rent provision and find themselves delinquent. Um, and so I just wanted you guys to know that. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. And so here I'm gonna cover the TAR lease, uh, specifically rent. Um, in the TAR lease, it's defined on page two, paragraph five. And they're very similar. The, the, the language is, is, is a little different, but, but they are similar. Um, in the TAR lease, paragraph 5D3, it stipulates, unless the parties agree otherwise, tenants may not pay in cash. But I want everyone here to know that if a landlord does allow and accept cash payments, the tenant has a right to a physical receipt. Interestingly, that is the only time a tenant has a right to a receipt. Uh, by right, I mean uh, enshrined in statute. Otherwise, a payment by any other means, um, there's, there's no, nothing addressed in the statute that, that obligates the landlord to, to provide a receipt. Um, the TR lease in paragraph six also stipulates that rent is considered paid when the landlord actually receives full payment. Now there's no definition in statute of what this means, this phrase actually receives, but the common understanding is money in hand, physical receipt. Um, for the purposes of paying rent, any late charges uh, or any late charges, the mailbox is not the agent for receipt. So in other words, if a tenant puts uh, the rent in the mailbox or in the, let's say in the, either in the mailbox or a drop box, um, it's not considered received and, and, and they should be aware of that. The landlord's acceptance of rent and late charges does not waive their right to enforce um, the default provisions in the TAR lease. In other words, they're basically telling the tenant, if you breach the lease in any way, we can still accept your rent and ask you to leave and, and then file an eviction if you don't. And finally, the lease in paragraph eight, the TR lease stipulates that regardless of any uh, notation, any writing on the payment, let's say you're paying by check or money order, the landlord has the, has the ability, the right to apply the rent payment first to any non-rent obligations, i.e. late charges, return payment charges, repairs, et cetera. This is the same thing I was talking about previously with the TAR lease. Um, so they give themselves that right in the TA, I'm sorry, in the TA lease, they give themselves that right in the TAR lease. The, the next section in, in the lease that, that the tenant should really familiarize themselves with is the lease term. Now, it seems self-evident, the lease begins on a particular date, ends on a particular date, um, but the, the provision is a little more complicated than that. And a tenant should just be aware of it uh, so they don't run afoul of it. Basically, um, the TAA lease, paragraph three, describes the meaning of the phrase advance written notice of termination or intent to move out. So a lease begins on a particular date and ends on a particular date, and they have to give advance written notice if they decide that they don't want to renew and if they intend to move out. Um, paragraph three states that after the lease termination date, the lease will automatically renew month to month unless the party gives at least and there's a, a blank there for the landlord to fill in. 30 days, 60, 90, et cetera. Uh, written notice of termination of intent to move out, okay? If, if that blank is left blank, um, then the assumption is it's 30 days. Now in the TAR lease, the lease term is defined in par page one, paragraph three, and the automatic renewal notice of termination is addressed in page one, paragraph four. For the tenant to lawfully end their responsibility under the terms of the lease, a tenant must give the landlord written notice. Everyone should understand that whenever you read the term written in a lease, the, the statutory understanding, as, as I understand it, means physical, physical paper, physical notice. Now, this is important, especially in this day and age where everybody's using their phone. The lease says, to uh, communicate with the landlord through a portal, 
gives the, land, the tenant the, the email for the front office, et cetera. They encourage electronic transmission. Um, the tenant should just know that the term written in their lease means physical. So in this case, it's physical notice of termination or intent to not renew prior to vacating the unit. Um, and again, it's typically 30, 60 or 90 days uh, that the tenant has to give the landlord. So I created an example here, um, and, I, and, and I, I'm hoping that y'all will follow this. Um, basically, this is a situation um, which is common to how a, tenant, uh, a tenant's lease comes to an end, very common actually. And the scenario um, unfolds as follows. A tenant's lease termination date, this is just a hypothetical example. The, the, the tenant's lease termination date is May 1, 2022. The lease requires 60 days advance written notice on or prior to May 1. That means that the deadline for proper 60 days advance written notice is March 1. Now, in this case, the tenant fails to give this written notice and the landlord fails to give notice of intent to not renew. So nobody said anything to each other. And May 1 goes by. On May 2, one day after the lease termination date, the lease enters the automatic renewal period. And per the lease, the tenant continues to be liable for all rent and all the terms under the lease, unless and until the tenant gives proper 60 days written notice of termination or intent to not renew. Meaning, if, for example, okay, we're in the same example here. The lease ended on May 1. Nobody gave any notice. Time has gone by. It's now June 24th. We're still in the automatic renewal period. The tenant decides to personally deliver valid 60 days advanced written notice to the landlord. By valid, this means that that written notice will have a new termination date of August 24th. Why? Because that's 60 days. Sixty days from June 24th. I had a, a brain fart there. I'm sorry. Um, so 60 days from June 24th, the day that no, the written notice is handed to the landlord, that uh, new termination date written in that notice should be August 24th. And that means that the tenant will be liable for the rent and all the terms through August 24th, okay? Now there is an exception in the, in the Texas uh, Association of Realtors lease, I've cited it there for you. Now, I just want everybody to note that rent may be increased in the auto renewal period with advanced written notice from the landlord to the tenant if the, if the lease allows, and typically the lease does allow. And so the next section in leases that the tenant should be aware of is, uh, are, is, is refers to late fees. Now, late fees are defined in the Texas Association, Apartment Association lease on page one, paragraph six, and the TAR lease uh, on page two, paragraph six. Uh, and Texas uh, law actually enshrines a, uh, a whole section governing um, late payment of, of rent and fees. And so a landlord um, under the statute cannot collect, now note that term, cannot collect a late fee. This does not mean that the landlord cannot charge a late fee. That is a specific and intentional uh, term that the, uh, as I understand it, that the, the various interests lobbied uh, the legislature to include. Um, so a landlord cannot collect a late fee until two full day calendar days have passed, have passed beyond the lease rent due date. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if everyone's muted. Um, so two days, two full calendar days have to pass. Um, so if rent's due on the first, the earliest date of late fee may be collected is the fourth. Uh, the first to the second is one full day. The second to the third is one full day. 
So the fourth is the first day that uh, late fees may be collected. They may be charged before that, but, but they can be collected only until the fourth day. Uh, then the late fee has to be reasonable, reasonable. And the statute has a definition of reasonable. It's very specific. I've elucidated it here. Um, there's, uh, it, it has to do with, it has to do with um, the number of dwelling units. Um, so it can't be 12% of the amount of a rent of rent for the rental period under a lease for a structure that contains not more than four dwelling units or 10% of the amount of rent uh, for the rent period under a lease uh, for a structure containing more than four dwelling units. And then uh, further, it says, or the late fee is more than the applicable amount under A or B, but not more than certain uncertain damages to the landlord related to the late payment of rent, including direct or indirect expenses, direct or indirect costs, overhead, et cetera. Uncertain damages. That's a phrase that's in the statute. Uh, it's intentional, uh, intentionally vague. Uh, it gives the landlord um, leeway to basically determine what those damages are. Um, a late fee may include an initial fee. Everyone knows that uh, in the lease, there's an initial fee typically, a late fee of X amount of dollars, and then there's uh, X amount of dollars charged uh, on a monthly basis. Um, on a daily basis. Now, the, the initial fee should be inclusive of the percentage calculation uh, that I just described in A and B above. The payment of the fee, the charge or other sum of money by a tenant does not waive the rights or remedies provided by Texas statute. In other words, um, a tenant may, may pay their rent and their late fees in full and may still uh, find that they are having an eviction filed against them. Um, that's just the case. And it would be a question uh, for the judge to determine whether that was uh, enforceable. Um, another section which is defined in both leases, the TAA and the TAR lease is the term notice. The following are merely the most common instances in which a property typically demands written notice. Um, again, uh, written means hard copy, hard physical notice. When a tenant makes a health or safety repair request, written notice is required. Written notice is required when a tenant submits a notice of termination, intent to not renew or intent to renew, notice to move out. Um, when a tenant submits a notice of complaint, if they're having problems with their neighbors, written notice is required. And when a tenant submits a report of criminal activity or self-reporting convictions, uh, or registrations as required by the Texas Association, Apartment Association uh, lease in paragraph 19.5. So yes, a landlord may tell the tenant and even encourage the tenant to communicate through a portal or through email. Um, or maybe the landlord and the tenant have built a rapport and they actually text message each other. The problem is if the, if the tenant wants to be able to enforce their rights, and say that they actually gave lawful notice of whatever issue, the notice in addition to whatever the lease says should be and must be given uh, phys in, in a physical format. Um, now, regarding health or safety repairs, it's not enough to email or to use the online portal, even if directed by a lease or to verbally report the issue to the landlord. These do not cons constitute legal notice for the purpose of reporting a health or safety repair. Um, to satisfy the tenant's obligations under law, the repair request must be delivered in writing, hard copy, as I stated, and either by hand or a trackable mail option, like uh, the, the U.S. Postal Service, FedEx, et cetera. Um, now, this is important. Why, why is email and the use of an online portal not lawful notice? Well, because it's not addressed in statute. There may be case law out there that, that uh, would prove me wrong, but the statute itself does not address electronic transmission of messages, i.e. email. And so the, the advice to a tenant is always keep pen and paper on hand, write it out uh, to the best of their ability and hand it to the landlord. And so I'm not sure, Paul, if, if there's any questions in the chat, but we are uh, coming to the next section. Just let me know.
No, I think we're good right now. Okay. And so here I've, I've tried to cover um, some common pitfalls with respect to the lease. I strongly advise that you read your lease. I mean, it sounds self-evident, but even I, um, and the best of us, they just, we just don't read verbatim all the fine print of the things that we sign. Um, so read your lease, keep it in a safe place. When in doubt, refer to it often to avoid um, these pitfalls that I'm gonna cover here. Now, the first is this notion of an implied warranty of habitability when searching for housing. The implied warranty of habitability is, is the common law principle that generally holds that a landlord must keep. And I underline that word uh, for a reason that I'll explain in a, in a bit. The landlord must keep a living dwelling in a safe and sanitary condition. So in the 68th and 69th uh, Texas legislative sessions, some time back, a landlord's duty to repair or remedy a health or safety condition, a tenant's and a landlord's legal remedies and other re related provisions were enacted into law. During this period, the legislature enacted the following language, effectively supplanting a tenant's implied warranty of habitability, among other of the landlord's warranties and duties. And basically section 92.061 states that the duties of a landlord and the remedies of a tenant under this subchapter are in lieu of, in lieu of, existing common law and other statutory law warranties and duties of a landlord for maintenance, repair, security, habitability, and non-retaliation and remedies of, ten of, of tenants for a violation of those warranties and duties. In other words, the health and safety section, the repair section uh, in, the, in the Texas uh, statute, chapter 92, replaces the common law uh, right, if you will, uh, for the implied warranty of habitability. In, in layman terms, it just means it used to be the fact, it used to be that when a tenant walks up to uh, a unit to, to, to look at it, that you know, they're thinking about renting it, that that unit, there was a, 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 an implied guarantee or an implied right that that unit would already be in habitable and safe condi condition. Um, but the health and safety, uh, uh, rather the repair, the, the repair statute that addresses health and safety issues, it basically replaced that warranty and it, and it places the burden on the tenant to give notice to the landlord that there's an issue that needs to be repaired that affects their health and safety. Um, and so what I'm saying here is that a tenant should never assume that a residential dwelling would be offered in a safe and sanitary condition prior to the lease signing. Where possible, I'm saying that a tenant should always personally view the unit that they are about to lease. And if repairs exist, the tenant should attempt to negotiate the repairs as a condition of lease signing. In other words, fix the broken window or I'm not signing the lease. Now I understand in this current climate of we, there's very little housing, a tenant doesn't have a whole lot of leverage. I'm just saying that, that, that they should make an attempt uh, to negotiate the repairs as a condition of the lease signing. If the landlord's unwilling, the tenant then has a decision to make, sign the lease and, submit the pro and then submit the proper written repair request in the hopes that the landlord's gonna actually do their obligation or don't sign the lease. Just determine whether or not you can, you can live with it. Uh, I know it sounds harsh, but th that's basically the way it, it, it works in Texas. And so here I talk about uh, health or safety repairs. Um, now this is, it, it's worth spending time on this because tenants so frequently have to deal with these issues. What is a health and safety repair? It, it is a repair in which any condition that materially affects a tenant, okay? So that's no hot water, no electricity, a broken window, a front door, uh, locks that don't lock or close, pest infestation, et cetera. There's no definition 
of a health and safety repair, except that it, the statute says it must materially affect a tenant. Um, and so the, the phrase materially affects is, is sort of left to interpretation. Um, but generally speaking, all of the, the common issues that tenants deal with that they would consider uh, health and safety do fall under the statute. Now, a tenant uh, will frequently, uh, as I was saying before, call or text or email a landlord about a repair issue, expecting the landlord to begin the repair. Generally, these methods of notice do not satisfy a tenant's requirement under the law. I'm saying generally here because ultimately the laws, um, your rights and remedies are, are, uh, are determined by a judge if you, you attempt to enforce them and a judge may May, may differ from my understanding. Um, but generally, they, they, they have to be in writing. And so, in short, the landlord has no legal obligation to begin a health or safety repair unless and until the following have been met. Number one, the tenant is current on all rent and other sums owed. And number two, the tenant has provided to the landlord a written notice describing the condition that materially affects their health and safety and asking that the issue be repaired or remedied. Now, does a tenant have a right to a health, uh, to the repair of a health and safety issue if they don't pay the rent? I say they do, but their ability to enforce that right is, uh, doesn't exist if they are not current on rent and all sums owed at the time that they make the request. So if they send the landlord a letter, a physical letter on May 1, and on May 1, on May 1, they are short five bucks in rent. The landlord will receive that letter, but they're not current on rent. And so the landlord's obligation is not triggered. Um, the right exists, but they, but they have to be current on rent. This is extremely important. Now, once proper notice is given, uh, the landlord must begin, and the statute says the landlord must begin making a diligent effort to repair or remedy the condition within a reasonable amount of time. What is a diligent effort? The statute doesn't define it. When I was at ATC, I would counsel tenants, look, in my view, a diligent effort is they're swinging hammers, okay? They're making material, meaningful progress towards the repair. They're ordering parts. They're actually doing work on the property. It is not merely an inspection. Um, and that's, that's my view. Now, uh, the statute doesn't define what a diligent effort is. Now, there is a rebuttable presumption that seven days from receipt of a proper uh, notice asking for repairs is a reasonable amount of time, seven days from receipt. It's important to note that the statute replaces, I'm sorry, that the statute places no deadline by which a condition must be fully repaired or remedied. This is a gray area of the law that frustrates many tenants as they wait for the repairs to be completed. This is significant. And, and in my experience, not a lot of people uh, know this because it's counterintuitive. You would think that there would be some sort of obligation, some sort of time constraint on a landlord actually completing the repairs. There is nothing in the statute. Um, and, and, and now I'm gonna get into a couple issues uh, that are addressed in the lease, um, typically addressed in the lease, the TAA and the TAR lease. The first one is bed bugs. Um, the TA lease has a, a bed bug addendum. And, and about this, I'll simply say that that addendum should be read carefully because it actually places the obligation on the tenant to perform certain acts in order for the tenant to be able to enforce their rights with respect to bed bugs under the lease. And if they don't perform those certain acts, then they are assumed to have in effect breached the lease if bed bugs uh, appear, if they have to deal with them. And, and, and those acts are, are, are noted here in italics. It basically says that the tenant is admitting by signing the lease that they've inspected the dwelling before moving in <clears throat> or signing the addendum and that they did not find any evidence of bed bugs or in bed bug infestation. It also asks the tenant to inspect the dwelling within 48 hours after moving in or signing the addendum. 
and it places the obligation on the tenant to notify the landlord of any bed bugs or bed bug infestation. Now, why is this, um, in my mind, a little ridiculous? Um, it is because if you've ever dealt with bed bugs, the early stages uh, of, of the formation of a bed bug are microscopic. They're basically almost invisible to the eye, almost invisible to the eye. Um, and so how would one know if you know, there's bed bug eggs, for example, in the carpet? You simply wouldn't. Um, but nevertheless, a tenant uh, should, should, should satisfy their obligations under this addendum and report their findings in writing to the landlord. And here I just state that bed bugs are common uh, and extremely difficult problem to resolve. Um, um, I'm sorry, I uh, was looking at my typo. Uh, an applicant can unawares physically carry the bed bugs into uh, the dwelling. In other words, bed bugs travel on people's clothes uh, and in, the, in their furniture, et cetera. Um, once established in a unit, bed bugs can actually travel from unit to unit through the walls. They come through the electrical outlets and that sort of thing. Proving what, that, some, that you did not bring the bed bugs into your dwelling is extremely difficult. And once established, bed bugs can be a burdensome and highly costly pest control issue. Typically, uh, the treatment for bed bugs can run anywhere from $150 to $1,500 or higher, depending on the method, or whether they spray or use a heat treatment. Um, so, you know, the folks that we are uh, advocating for, um, needless to say, uh, would be in a, a, a difficult position if they, if they were saddled with a $1,500 bill. Um, I would be in a difficult position if I were saddled with such a bill. So bed bugs are extremely difficult, not just because of the nature of the problem, um, but because of uh, one's inability to prove where they came from. Um, the, next, the next issue, which is extremely common, is mold. And for many reasons, mold, I would argue, is the most difficult repair problem to resolve to the satisfaction of the tenant, to the satisfaction of the tenant, not the landlord. Mold grows anywhere moisture exists for at least 24 hours. And so mold is common in kitchen and bathroom areas and within HVAC ducting, within the walls, ceilings, other places. The TA lease often includes a mold addendum, and I've hyperlinked it here. In essence, the addendum holds that the tenant is liable for a mold problem if, among other things, there's a condition in the unit that is causing mold and the tenant fails to notify the landlord. Now, this is a real problem because, as you know, and anybody can have a slow leak under the kitchen sink and not know it for many, many months. Um, paragraph three of the TA lease, uh, of the mold addendum states, in part, promptly notify us, the landlord, in writing of any signs of water leaks, infiltration, or mold. And paragraph uh, seven states that if you comply with this addendum, if you fail to comply with this addendum, you can be held responsible for property damage to the dwelling and any health problems that may result. Basically, they're saying they can't fix the problem if you don't tell them about it, which is true. Um, now, it's important to note that Texas regulates the profession of mold remediation. In other words, there are mold, licensed mold remediators, just as there are licensed plumbers, licensed electricians, et cetera. But interestingly, Texas does not generally treat the presence of mold in a tenant's dwelling any different than any other health or safety issue. This is a problem in my mind um, because uh, mold can cause severe health issues. And yet, um, it's not really treated uh, differently than, you know, a broken window or uh, a missing lock. And so if there are no other questions, I'm going to move to a section uh, entitled Other Best Practices for Tenants. We had one question real quick. Um, yeah. It was, they were asking uh, if written notice has to be a hard physical copy or could written notice um, be written in an email or a maintenance request in a resident portal. And this is in regards to health and safety concerns. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and, and, and the presentation does cover, cover this. Basically, um, 
the term written to answer this question, the term written, a, a, a case manager, an advocate, and a tenant should all, always assume that the term written means hard copy, physical paper. The tenant should always do what the lease tells them to do. That, that should be an assumed because the lease places those obligations on the tenant. They have to comply with the lease. If the lease says, excuse me, tell the landlord of a repair through a portal, the tenant should do that. But the law does not obligate the landlord to begin repairs until the landlord receives the physical notice, the physical letter. And you know they're not gonna tell you that in the lease, but th that's what the law is. So that's, that's the answer to that. It, it, you should do whatever the lease says, but you should also put it in writing, keep a copy and deliver it to the landlord. Okay, so basically uh, a lot of this is common sense. Um, I, I wrote this section um, primarily for, for case managers and advocates um, to convey to their, to their clients so that they can just develop good habits as tenants. Uh, it's a good practice to document everything and at all times. As a practical matter in Texas, a tenant must be able to prove their position with documentation. In other words, hard copy paper pictures, emails, et cetera. It is lawful in Texas to audio or video record another individual without their knowledge or consent if you and the individual and the other individual, the person being recorded, are both physically standing on Texas soil. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna say, be careful with this. If you're on the phone with somebody, you don't know where they are. They may say they're in the front office, they may not be. Their landlord may have their cell, their, the, the front office routed to their cell phone and he may be sitting or she or she may be sitting on a boat in the Caribbean. You just don't know. So unless the person is standing in front of you, I would advise not to record them. But if they are standing in front of you and you can do it safely and you feel safe about it, the law will support you recording them without telling them they're being recorded. Um, and so with respect to documenting everything, uh, a lot of, ex uh, some examples of instances that should be documented are paying rent, <clears throat> um, making other payments to the landlord, fees authorized by the lease, uh, damages caused by the tenant, et cetera. Repair requests of any kind should be uh, documented, i.e. Um, put in writing, physical writing. Complaints to the landlord of any issue uh, with respect to neighbors, property staff, outside parties, whomever. Uh, requests for documentation, such as leases, ledgers, copies of the bills, et cetera. Um, written responses issued to the lease. Uh, it, I'm sorry, written responses to issued lease violations and or notices to vacate. Um, that's extremely important that, that you document, um, especially lease violations and, note, and, and any received notices to vacate. And notices to the landlord fulfilling the tenant's lease obligations, i.e. notices of intent to not renew. Uh, if a landlord says uh, you got to take those potted plants off of your porch, you go ahead and do it. If, if the lease um, you know, says that you can't have potted plants and then you document it by giving the landlord notice. A tenant should keep receipts and copies of all notices received and given. And if there's any question as to whether the individual, uh, again, uh, being recorded is in Texas, don't record them. The final one here is uh, make all payments in a provable manner. Basically, it is always the tenant's responsibility to prove a payment has been made. A case manager uh, or an advocate should never drop money in a drop box or a night box ever. Um, they should always, uh, if they're gonna hand, physically deliver it, they should always place it in somebody's hand. Um, the, the tenant should, should, should make any payments in a way that they can prove they've made them later. And so if paying rent by hand, I suggest take a friend as a witness and ask for a receipt. Um, Except for cash rent payments, there's no statutory right for a receipt. We talked about that. 
A landlord simply has no obligation to give you one. And if they refuse, uh, you should record the transaction with your phone, either by video or audio. Um, although they have an, no obligation to give you a receipt if you're paying by check or money order uh, or credit card, you should always ask for a receipt. And if they refuse to give you the receipt, you should record the transaction. And so I, I, I placed, I sort of drafted a, a little um, dialogue here in which um, a rent transaction where a landlord refuses to provide the receipt. And so in this example, a tenant enters the front office to pay the rent. The tenant says, afternoon, my name's John Perez. What's your name? The property staffer says, David, I'm a leasing agent. So the tenant says, hey, David, so I'm here to pay the rent. I have a money order for June rent. I'd like to hand this to you and get a receipt in return showing that I paid full rent in today's date. Then the property staffer says, oh, well, typically we've never provided tenants with rent receipts. They just usually leave their money in our Dropbox or pay online. And so the tenant says, well, can you provide me with a receipt anyway? And the property staffer says, not really. I wouldn't know where to begin. We don't have a form. Uh, for rent receipts. All right, well, I'm handing you a money order for my June rent in the amount of 900. Today is June 25th. Thank you for receiving it. And the property staffer uh, says, you're welcome. Now, why did the tenant ask the property staffer um, their name? Because they're recording the transaction. And if it's not on video, you need to be able to say this is the person who, who identified themselves in the recording. Um, and it's, and I, um, for the same reason, uh, at the end of this dialogue, the tenant says, declares basically in the recording, I'm handing you a money order for June rent. This is the amount of the money order. T this is today's day and you have received it. And all of that's done because if it's an audio recording, you can't see what's happening. So you, you have to be told what's happening. Um, and that would be, as far as I understand it, if, if, if a, a judge allowed it admissible in, in, in court. And so here are just a bunch of questions basically that I suggest that, um, that a tenant can ask a landlord when viewing a dwelling. Um, I'm not gonna go through every single one, um, but a lot of them are, are pretty commonsensical, some are not. Uh, the first one has to do with um, with when the building was built, because there's, as, as most, most folks know, a federal law requiring a landlord to give uh, the tenant notice of the possibility of lead in the home if, if the building was built before 78. Um, I think it's good for a tenant to inquire about the HVAC system, the air conditioning system. When was it installed? If they can know that, uh, has it ever been worked on in the unit that they're thinking about renting? Are the windows single or double paned? All of these things have to do with the efficiency of the unit, especially uh, the folks that a lot of us advocate for um, being of limited means. You don't wanna get hit with a $700 electric bill if you move in in the winter um, and then the first summer comes and you've got that bill because it could bankrupt you and, and then cause you uh, to, to have to face an eviction filing. So you really wanna try and inquire uh, or at least inspect these things when you when you come into uh, a unit when you're looking at a unit. Um, what else? Um, you know, I think it's relevant for a lot of folks that we advocate for whether or not there's on on-site security to to help to help them feel secure in their dwelling and and in their surroundings. Um, you should always ask if they allow pets. And there's a a thing that's really been enforced uh, probably in the past 10 or 15 years in Austin called pet rent. Uh, I personally think it's, it's a little ridiculous, but it, it, it is written into some leases where they'll actually charge you a daily uh, fee for having your pet. So you should, you should always ask about that and whether or not you can opt out of it. Um, the, a lot of apartment complexes will, will, will affirmatively provide a trash service. In other words, without you asking, just by signing the lease, you enroll yourself in this service and then they charge you a fee. You should ask one if they provide that service and if they do and you don't want it or you can't afford it, you should ask if you can opt out of that service. They may say no. Um, and 
that's a problem because tenants don't have a whole lot of leverage in Texas, but, um, but you should always ask. Um, parking, is there parking? Do they charge uh, for a parking permit? Is there parking for guests? Do they need a, a, a particular permit, et cetera? And so this next section um, is going to get into specific issues that we see um, here at ECHO uh, as we work with our partner uh, programs in the COC. And so if there's no questions on the previous content, I'll go right into this. So <clears throat> as an advocate here at ECHO, we, we commonly see um, these issues uh, with tenants that are referred to us for, for, for housing placement. Unauthorized occupants, all right? So everyone understands that a lease only authorizes the signatories to the lease or those named under the occupant provision of the lease. Anyone outside of that is unauthorized um, if they are in violation of the guest policy. And there is a guest policy written into uh, the lease. And so in this case, when there's unauthorized occupants, ECHO works with partner COC programs to support the tenant in removing them um, or encouraging them to leave. And um, with the tenant's permission in an appropriate time, ECHO may make a direct request to the landlord that the locks be changed because it's not uncommon, unfortunately, that um, some folks who, who we uh, advocate with and for um, are taken advantage of while they're in their dwelling. In other words, folks come over to hang out and never leave. Um, and so in, in those cases, uh, if we can lawfully encourage the, 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 the unauthorized occupants to leave, um, once that is secured, then we ask, uh, we may ask um, that the landlord change the locks and provide the, the tenant with a new key to ensure that those folks uh, don't have access. Um, tenant disturbances, this can take a, a lot of different forms, but we work, um, we work with, uh, to communicate with the, with the program and the landlord to obtain documentation regarding the disturbance, lease violations, et cetera, the nature of the disturbance, and then we work to, to take steps to address the issue. Um, tenant caused damage. Uh, ECHO works with partner COC programs to notify the landlord of any damage, to expedite the repair, and to determine if ECHO can assist in the repair Cost this, this may this, this last point whether or not Echo can uh, assist in the repair cost. That last point differs from uh, property to property because Echo has uh, unique agreements with each property, um, and so that's something that a, a caseworker can inquire with Echo if uh, if their client uh, you know broke a window or um, whatever. Um, the notion of abandonment is defined. It's actually explicitly defined in the Texas Apartment Association lease. There's, um, I think, five elements that must be met before a landlord can um, enforce the abandonment provision. But if they attempt to do that um, because, uh, you know, the tenant disappears um, and can't be found, we will work with the COC program and the landlord to ensure that the tenant that's gone missing is not uh, if possible, deemed to have abandoned their unit. In other words, we're going to try and mitigate or, or uh, rather prevent, um, discourage rather, the landlord from enforcing the abandonment provision if, if, if we can, so j just in time to, to try and locate um, the tenant who still has a lawful right to the dwelling if, if those elements in the lease have not been met. Um, and then eviction prevention. Uh, and a thing called a mutual rescission. Um, so in, 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 with respect to these issues, uh, ECHO will work with a partner property, I'm sorry, partner program, the COC program to ensure that any serious lease violations are addressed expeditiously and to the mutual satisfaction of the, of the partner COC program and the landlord. If all efforts to resolve the issue in question are exhausted, ECHO may at the landlord's request, this is the key, the land, the, it's our policy that the landlord should initiate the request for a mutual rescission, which will be signed by the tenant and, and then preparations to find alternative housing for the tenant begin in earnest. 
Now, the execution of a mutual rescission is at the sole discretion of the landlord. It is an absolute last option and is strictly to avoid an eviction filing against the tenant. Let me clarify this. A mutual rescission is not a phrase that appears in the Texas Apartment Association or the Texas Association of Realtors lease. It is not a thing which a tenant has a right to. It is a form, uh, really it's a contract, it's a one page contract that, um, that we have drafted and that landlords with whom we work are familiar with and have agreed, generally agreed to consider uh, initiating if circumstances uh, arise, which, you know, uh, Echo and the, and the case manager of a particular program were simply unable to resolve the issue to the satisfaction of either the tenant or the landlord. The landlord is threatening to file an eviction. Then Echo and the landlord may engage in a conversation that raises the issue of a mutual rescission. We would bring that issue, if the landlord wanted it, we would bring that to the attention of the case manager and then we would see if the tenant would be willing to do that. Obviously, uh, much uh, discretion is given to the caseworker and to the tenant who has rights, the caseworker who knows their client the best. Um, so I just wanna emphasize, mutual rescission is not a thing that exists uh, out there, uh, sort of in the quote unquote in the real world, you know, outside of the scope of, of tenants that are referred to ECHO. It, it, it's, it's, it's unique to, to our policies and what we do. And so a tenant has uh, rights. I just wanna say um, that ECHO referred tenants, it's important for case workers, if, or case managers um, and uh, advocates on this call to understand that tenants that are referred through ECHO um, that their rights under the statute are not augmented by virtue of the fact that ECHO and uh, your organization has a partnership. So for example, LifeWorks or Caritas, um, we work with caseworkers um, uh, from those two organizations all the time. Um, they have clients, their clients are tenants, they have rights enshrined by the statute. Those rights are not enhanced in any way just because they referred their tenant through ECHO. Um, and if a case manager, uh, if as a case manager, you have any information that you believe would give your client special consideration in any way, i.e. a disability requiring an accommodation, the need to have a service animal, et cetera, we just ask that you consider whether that information would help ECHO uh, place the client in proper housing. Um, and and um, you know your client the best. And so um, with privacy concerns and all of those considered, we would just ask uh, whether or not you deem that information uh, worthwhile uh, to the placing of that tenant in housing. And so what I've done, I'm, I'm kind of nearing the end here. Um, can't see the time. Um, wow. Um, what I've done here, I'm gonna speed this up a bit, um, is I've actually drafted templates for your clients to be able to use. These are hyperlinked uh, to a Google, uh, a Google account, uh, open source uh, Google Drive, and, and I'll just leave it there and it'll live in perpetuity. You can download them, you can amend them as you will, um, and they're specific to these issues that you see here, unlawful lockout, uh, lease violations, notice to vacate, et cetera. I think they're useful because they're basically already written for you. You just have to fill in the blanks and add any, any um, language that you think is, um, is necessary. And I say at the top under the guidance, um, the best way to deliver any notice uh, is, is again um, through, um, through the mail, specifically certified mail. Now, certified mail, I think costs uh, upwards of $7 these days. That's not always possible for folks. The next best method is a hand delivery of the notice. Take a picture of it with your cell phone so you have a copy. And then a hand delivery of the notice with a reliable witness. Why did I underline reliable witness? Because what I, what I mean by reliable is somebody that the tenant can count on to stand next to them in court if they have to testify before a judge. That is what I mean by reliable. 
And that includes uh, the witness you might take to pay the rent. It should always be somebody you can actually rely on to support what they're witnessing uh, and to be able to convey that properly. Um, and then finally, I just provide um, additional uh, resources. And um, the first are, are uh, legal resources. These are folks who provide uh, typically pro, pro bono legal uh, services. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll probably recognize some of these here, Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, uh, BLS, Laurel Referral Services, uh, Legal Services Center of uh, Texas. Um, there is the Texas Advocacy Project, uh, which uh, advocates uh, for survivors um, through free legal services and the justice system. Um, and uh, LASA, which is also a legal advocacy for uh, survivors of sexual assault. Um, there's uh, legal aid for, uh, for those um, struggling with mental health issues. Uh, it's a particular clinic or project within Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. There's the uh, Travis County Mental Health Public Defender, Disability Rights Texas, um, and on and on. Uh, there's some legal aid there for veterans. And then non-legal assistance, as I was talking about, Austin Tenants Council is an excellent organization. It's been around since the 70s. Um, I can say, uh, they try to handle, they, ha they handle more than what they should. Uh, there's just so many folks, so many tenants out there that need help and they, and they come to Austin Tenants Council. Um, and, uh, and so they provide a really good service. Um, then there's obviously the state law library. This Texas uh, Tenants Rights Handbook is a PDF. It was last updated in 2019. So take that with a grain of salt. And then the final is a Texas Tenant Advisor. It's main, that's a website that's maintained by Texas Housers, which is not an organization that provides direct services for tenants, but advocates for issues around housing uh, broadly. And so that is the end of the presentation. I thought I added my email at the end of this and I didn't. And so if anybody wants to take this down, I'm just gonna give you my email right now. Maybe I'll put it in the chat. Uh, my email is Daniel, my first and last name, austinecho.org. There's my email. And so I just wanna thank everybody for attending. I wanna thank Paul for his assistance and Lyric uh, for monitoring.